So I am with the president of the Theopolis Institute, Peter Lightheart. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Glenn. Great to be here. So yesterday, uh, somebody asked me, who is Peter Lightheart? And I was, first of all, shocked that somebody didn't know who Peter Lightheart was. But, but then I started to, to reach around for descriptions of you. And I wonder if I could, uh, if I could run this past you as, a, as a, an, an overarching kind of uh, uh, passion for you. It, it seems to me that you see patterns and structures and structures that are really there, structures that uh, grip you and then you grip others by helping us to notice those structures. So with the Bible, uh, you help us to see deep exegesis, uh, the name of, of, of a brilliant book of yours. Uh, so when it comes to the Bible, you see these patterns. When it comes to creation, there are patterns that you're picking up. So, you know, Traces of the Trinity, another great book of yours, seeing that there are, there, there are deep structures to reality. And then in, in the Christian life, there are structures. So the baptized body, for instance, as, as an example of your love of, of sacraments, uh, your love of liturgy, your love of seeing, there are deep patterns to the Christian life too. Have you ever, have I got the pattern of the patterns right there? Is, is that something that sort of drives you at all? Uh, I think that's right. I'd, I'd start out by saying the surprise comes to me if people do know who I am, not when they don't. <laughs> sure. um, th this is a, uh, I attribute most of that uh, passion, interest, and whatever ability I have to uh, my long association with James Jordan, who is a, a, a biblical theologian, um, an American biblical theologian that I've been associated with for 25 some years. Yes. And uh, I, I was really renewed in my reading of the Bible and my interest in reading the Bible and, and the other kinds of things you're talking about by encountering Jim's work and by my long association with him. Yes. Um, but I think that that's a good way to describe the, hmm. the overall agenda, my, my, uh, uh, the, the way that several different interests link together. Uh, I think the hmm. searching for discerning uh, patterns of God's work in Scripture, in history, yes. in creation is, uh, yes. is an overarching interest. And a quick way into James Jordan, would, would seeing through new eyes, is, is that, is that a, a good introduction for people to James Jordan? It is. That's, yeah. that's, the, his kind of, that's his biblical theology yeah. summary and overview, and I think it's the best book on the Bible that I've ever read, and yes. uh, I'd highly recommend it. Yes, it's gripping, isn't it? You sort of open up to you know, an early chapter on rocks, yeah. and all of a sudden he'll give you a biblical theology of rocks yeah. that teaches you the gospel in ways you'd never imagined. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, a lot of people have the experience of encountering Jim's work and initially finding it very strange and mm. an odd way of reading scripture, an odd way of looking at the world. And uh, I know my Theopolis uh, associate, Alistair Roberts, has said this when he was a teenager, he picked it up and read a couple of chapters and said, this is very strange, I'm gonna put this aside. <laughs> but then later comes back, came back and looked at it. Um, my experience with Jim's work over the years has been to, uh, even when he says things that I think are may not be right and I think they're outlandish, um, it usually is just a matter of me catching up. It, yes. it takes him about two seconds to make, con make connections that take me several years to make and then yes. A few years later, I recognize, oh yeah, that's what he was talking about. I, I see that now. Yes. Well, he must, be, he must be capturing something about the Bible because surely that is our reaction to the Bible too. <laughs> when we open up the book, the, right. know, Karl Barth called it the strange new world of the Bible. Yes. Jim likes to call it the deep weird. The deep weird. The deep weird. Yeah. yeah. That's what really, uh, he's focused a lot on passages and parts of the Bible that are strange and off-putting and uh, trying, in some ways trying to make the Bible less familiar to us because... Uh, we get used to hearing the Bible, at least certain parts of the Bible, that become very familiar, and uh, we we forget how odd it is and how strangely it's put together, and the kinds of things that God seems to be interested in that um, that just seem like odd obsessions. So, yes, uh, you know, yeah. rocks. Why why are there references to rocks in Eden, and uh, mm -hmm. why are the all these rules about different sorts of unclean animals or uh, you know, rituals for sacrifice and detailed rules like uh, genealogies, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of things that don't don't really fit our way of looking at the world. Mm. But these are very prominent topics mm. and and uh, genres in the Bible. Mm. And uh, that's one of the things that I think Jim has contributed is just uh, taking the Bible as it is. This is the way God has chosen to reveal Himself, and this is what we have to grapple with. 
And if that means we need to start looking, as, as his title says, start looking at the world and the Bible through new eyes, then that's what the Bible is for, to give us those new eyes. Right, right. And so at the Theopolis Institute, people come and, and immerse themselves in that kind of stuff. What, what is the philosophy behind the Theopolis Institute? Yeah. The Theopolis was uh, started in 2013, and uh, we exist as a think tank, a training center, in order to teach people how to read the Bible more deeply. Uh, we also focus on Christian liturgy and uh, teach uh, people how to understand and practice the liturgy and uh, try, to, try to show the connection between Scripture and the liturgy, mm. how the Bible gives us instructions about worship, and also how the Bible is, uh, comes, kind of comes into its own mm. as it's read, taught, preached within the context of the liturgical assembly. Mm -hmm. So those two things are uh, we're interested, not just in those as separate topics, but the connection between Scripture and liturgy. Mm. Um, and we have courses uh, that, uh, where we teach bi different biblical books, different liturgical topics. And then also we have an interest in how uh, the church uh, can and should affect uh, surrounding culture. So the, the right. cultural transformation is an, another area of interest. Mm -hmm. Our conviction is that the, the sanctuary where God encounters his people in the liturgy, that's the place where cultural transformation begins. And mm -hmm. if the church is going to be effective in uh, changing the world. It has to start in the presence of God in the worship uh, and in worship that's biblically grounded, worship that's saturated in scripture. That's the kind of worship that forms a people that can be culturally transformative. So the cultus leads out to the culture. Correct. And that's the, that's the sort of thing, which is what I'd love to, to talk to you about really. Um, because uh, Speak Life is uh, an evangelistic ministry and, and we seek to make the good news of Jesus known to those uh, beyond the church. And uh, I, I guess uh, when you look at different theologies of mission, um, everybody is wanting to say that the church is missional. Mm -hmm. um, how they get there, th there are different ways of getting there. But everyone wants to say, okay, we are this sort of resurrected Israel, this multinational, multi-ethnic, global Israel, a, a priesthood, a royal priesthood to disciple the nations. Mm -hmm. Therefore, for the church to be the church, the church is missional. Um, but then different people sort of put the emphasis on different parts mm -hmm. of that sentence. Mm -hmm. And so some people will say, look, for the church to be the church, it has to be missional. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, all your stuff about liturgy, mm -hmm. Peter, I mean, come on, we've got, to, we've got to ditch that. We've got to get out there. We've got to be into the culture and integrate because for the church to be the church, we have to be missional. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of that, people will say, well, simply for the church to be the church, we will be missional. Mm -hmm. You know, almost a kind of, if you build it, they will come <laughs> sort of theology as well. Mm -hmm. is, is that a sort of a low resolution uh, analysis of, the, of the, the spectrum that people line up on? Yeah, I think there's a, 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 that, that uh, fits my experience and I think that, that does describe different orientations or uh, um, passions that people have. I, I've been helped by um, an, a German-American philosopher named Eugen Rosenstock Husey, mm -hmm. uh, who tries to summarize everything in what he calls the cross of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, the cross of reality has a, a horizontal line, which is a timeline, and a vertical line, which is a space line. And he says, human life is lived out at the center of that cross, caught between uh, the obligations to our heritage and our past, and the equal obligations that we have to a call to a future, something new. Mm -hmm. um, those don't easily line up, and we're constantly pulled apart by that. We're also, uh, I think the, the, what you're describing is really the spatial mm -hmm. distinction. There's an inside and then there's an outside. Mm. And there are Christians who are interested in building the body life and mm. uh, ministry within the body, which is hugely important in the New Testament, of course. Mm. Uh, Spirit has given gifts to everyone so that the body can be built up. And then there are others that are gonna say, no, what we really need to do is get out of our four walls and go out into the world. Mm. Uh, to have a really healthy church, you need all of that. You need the traditionalists, as it were, who are reminding us constantly of our heritage, uh, the, the tradition of the church. Uh, you need our visionaries, our prophets, who are pulling us into something new to address the new challenges of our time. You need the, those missionaries who are pulling us out, and you need people who are interested in body life. But mm -hmm. the church is lived out, living out its life at the center of that, pulled in all these different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, you need all those different influences to have a healthy church. 
Right. So what are the dangers of doing the, the entirely missional thing? What are the, what are, what are the, what are the dangers of saying, uh, let's get out of the four walls and be church? Let's not do church, let's be church. What are, what are the dangers there, do you see? Well, I, I think there are several things that I would caution against. I, I think uh, in, the, in the world that I'm in, that's, uh, I think, the, the weakness of uh, kind of reformed Protestantism has been, historically been, on the missional side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a strong emphasis on doctrine. There's a strong emphasis on building Christian community uh, and uh, not as strong an emphasis uh, on the mission of the church and evangelism outside of the church. So I'm, I think I probably have a somewhat different, uh, uh, different experience of that. Um, I, there are several things that I would see problematic about that. Um, we could put it in terms of some of Jesus' parables, which are parables of invitation or mission. Um, Jesus tells parables of a king who's having a wedding feast, who sends his mm -hmm. uh, servants out to invite people to the wedding feast. Uh, that's, a, that's an evangelistic, a mission um, image. Uh, we're uh, out to invite people, but to what? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, right. What are they going to find when they come in? Is, right. is there going to be a wedding feast for them to, to uh -huh. enter into? Right. Um, and if, if, it, if it's not, if you have, and I, I'm, I mean that quite directly, if you don't have um, a festive center to the church, mm. a Eucharistic center to the church, mm. Mm. then I think your evangelism is going to, uh, in some ways, be directionless. There's an invitation to join something, but is it an invitation to join the community of Christ, mm. which is a festive community? So um, in, order to, in order to, I guess, to capture that whole parable, you need the messengers to go out. Mm. You need the people preparing the feast for them to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, I'd, this is more of a, of a contextual thing uh, for our particular uh, challenges in the modern world, maybe particularly in urban settings, um, that um, what, what, are, what are people respond, what are they responsive to? What are they looking for? Mm -hmm. You have uh, huge numbers of migrants coming to a city like, uh, mm -hmm. like London. Mm -hmm. uh, all the great world cities are full of immigrants and migrants. Uh, they're displaced from their home countries. Uh, they may be separated from family. Uh, and what they, what they need and are looking for is fellowship, friendship, mm. connections with mm. people. Uh, and if you have, a, have an evangelistic ministry that doesn't have a strong uh, community behind it um, to invite people into, then again, you're, you're not really ministering to the full, uh, to the needs. And that, none of that is to say that the messengers don't need to go. The messengers need to right. go. Right. Uh, but there needs to be uh, a, a festive center and a community for them to be invited into. That's interesting. Because quite often the, the polarity is between, well, Old Testament was just, which, which is centripetal and which is centrifugal? <laughs> I always get confused. Yeah, the, the one that I'll leave in. you to have the confusion. <laughs> yes, we can, uh, we can edit this in later. The centripetal. The centrifugal <laughs> option is uh, whatever the, the the sucking into the center of temple life in the in the Old Testament, and then so the schema goes. The New Testament is the scattering, mm. and out we go. Whereas I, I guess if you're saying that we need these these festal centers, yeah. in one sense there is a scattering, but it's yeah. a, it's a scattering of more miniature centers right. of festal life. So that it's, it's not a it's not a total scattering, right. um, and it and it's not a total centralizing either. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think it's 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 more of a rhythm of uh, mm. you know breathing out and breathing in. Uh, mm. So the uh, we were talking in terms of the parables. There's an invitation into that festive center, into that community life. Um, but at the same time, if the if the uh, worship of the church is biblically founded and shaped by Scripture then that, there has to be an impetus to go out from there. Right. Um, the image we use at Theopolis a good bit is uh, the images we find starting in Genesis 2 with, the, the, with Eden and the, the rivers going out of Eden. That gets transformed over the course of the Old Testament into the tabernacle, mm -hmm. into the temple, finally Ezekiel's temple. And in each mm -hmm. case you have a water source. And especially when you get to Ezekiel's temple, mm -hmm. the water source is not confined to the temple. Mm -hmm. The water, source, the, the water, the, the river in Ezekiel 47 has its source in the temple, mm -hmm. but then it flows out. And as it flows out, it refreshes the land and 
trees grow and fruit is produced and then it goes out to the Dead Sea and refreshes the Dead Sea. Right. So it's from that festive center that the, the life of the church flows out. Uh, so there's a, there's a movement back and forth. People are invited, invited in. Uh, they're filled with the Spirit. They're caught up in the mission of the Spirit. And mm -hmm. so they're sent out again so that they can invite more people in. And then mm -hmm. that, again, mm -hmm. impels them to go out. If the, if the liturgy is functioning properly, then it's a festive center mm -hmm. that, is a, uh, that is a welcoming place. That is a, there's, a, there's a kind of uh, evangelistic uh, uh, goal or target there. But it's also an incorporation into the mission of Jesus. Mm -hmm. so you're, you're being joined to the Christ who came and uh, was sent to us. And so yeah. in the Spirit and... Uh, in union with Christ, we're sent out from you the liturgy. You become a sent one in the sent one right. by the Spirit. And out you go, and the, the liturgy has just told you, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Right. And in the name of Christ, right. out we go. And I'm often uh, telling people about, uh, Vishal Mangalwadi makes this point uh, in, in his book about the Bible, the book that built your world. He mm. said that uh, um, the Reformed churches in Holland, um, one of the things that marked them off uh, as, as being very different is that uh, the priest would lock the doors on Sunday night mm -hmm. so that on Monday morning people would come to light a votive candle or something mm -hmm. and, and, and the priest would shoo them away and mm -hmm. say, well, no, you, you meet Christ as a cobbler, you meet Christ as a milkmaid, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. off you go, mm -hmm. go in peace to love mm -hmm. and serve the Lord. Do, do you think in, in the rhythm that you're talking about, um, our churches could be better at doing that, you know, far more the festal center on a Sunday and then lock the door <laughs> and send, send them out the Monday morning? Yeah. Um, that sounds extreme, <laughs> locking the door, because uh, I, I, have, uh, I have some uh, uh, appreciation for a, a daily office, um, yeah. having, a, having daily liturgical life in, in the church. Uh, so I wouldn't want to lock the door, but I think that I understand the, the uh, impulse there, and I think that's correct, that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the church is gathered and then dispersed, and we're dispersed into settings where yeah, we, we, we do, uh, we have opportunities for uh, verbal evangelism of various sorts, but we're also dispersed into vocations where we're uh, carrying out the mission of God in another sense. There's a kind of culture building mission that's part of God's purpose for humanity. And Christians are incorporated into the last Adam so that we can have dominion over the, uh, over the creation. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be part of the, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and I think the, the, uh, the thought is right, I, I wouldn't lock the church. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after the daily office. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's after, right. After sending them off. Okay. Let's, let's think about, therefore, as, as you scatter, and perhaps we'll, we'll circle back around to, to what you would do and, and what kind of uh, lenses you would look through evangelistically to, to look at the Sunday service. But uh, let's think about the, the, the church scattered. And, you know, you've painted a, a great picture, Christ's picture, of inviting people to, to the wedding feast. Mm -hmm. um, Often evangelism, the evangelism that I am invited uh, to do is to put on maybe events mm -hmm. um, that would, would take place outside of a church environment. Um, and I've always got in the back of my head something that I heard James Jordan say years ago, which relates to that parable. He said, you know, um, the king doesn't invite people to a lecture series. Mm -hmm. right. The king invites people to, right. to a feast and a meal. Right. Um, and so... I've got that going on in one side of my brain, and on the other side of my brain, I'm thinking, ah, yes, but what is the place of the word? Mm -hmm. What is the place of the proclaimed gospel mm -hmm. in, in this sort of Monday to Saturday life mm -hmm. of, of scattering with, with the gospel? How do, how do you bring those two things together in terms of the, the scattered church proclaiming the gospel? What would, what would a, an event um, look like if you were Pope? And you were, if you were in charge of evangelism, what, what, what would, what would uh, an evangelistic event look like? Yeah, well, I think that um, the, the kinds of, the, the comment you, you uh, cited from uh, Jim Jordan, um, uh, that, that's the kind of thought I was trying to express with the reference to the parable. I don't think he's saying that that's, um, that means that the uh, uh, church doesn't do other sorts of, it doesn't mean that there aren't places for, for the church to lecture. Yes. Or to debate or to mm -hmm. argue. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, clearly, we have mm. New Testament precedent for that. Paul out in the markets in uh, Greco-Roman cities. Paul in the temple. Mm. Jesus in the temple. Reasoning in, in the synagogues. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in the synagogues. Exactly right. Yeah. So there, are, um, I think there that that's um, that has to be part of the church's mission. I think the 
uh, in saying that the church has a festal center, the, one, of the, one of the distortions of that is that uh, the church only has the liturgical gathering for the Eucharist on the Lord's Day. And that's, as long as we keep that going, then we're fulfilling the mission. Uh, that would be a distortion, I think, of the biblical picture, mm-hmm. and it's not what I'm, what I'm, what, what I would advocate. I think there's all kinds of venues, uh, both live venues, the kinds of things that you're talking about that you that you're involved in. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of media opportunities. Obviously, today, mm-hmm. where you can put out uh, various forms of evangelism or apologetics uh, into the marketplace. Um, so uh, all of those are crucial to the church fulfilling its mission. Um, and the you know without that the invitation is not going out. Uh, you have some people have to be out in places where uh, there are unbelievers to hear, mm-hmm. uh, ready to say something and uh, proclaim the gospel to them. Mm-hmm. So I, I wouldn't want to play those off against each other. I think historically that's um, I, I attribute some of this to the just the fragmented nature of the Christian church today. That mm-hmm. you have the evangelistic types tend to cluster around evangelistically oriented churches and mm-hmm. the liturgical types who want to stay in their four walls and enjoy their historic liturgies tend to cluster in churches that have historic liturgies. Mm-hmm. And if we had a, a, a unified church, we would those people would be fighting with each other <laughs> mm-hmm. because some would be saying, no, we got to evangelize. Some would be saying, no, we got to work on the liturgy. And they'd both be right, yes. but they would be in the same church working out their uh, different orientations. and. I think the church would be more balanced if it were for if everyone was forced together. Mm-hmm. But there are very few churches that have that kind of balance today. Mm-hmm. Speaking of lectures out in the marketplace, I'm just sort of reminded of Jordan Peterson mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, you know a, a man who's found an audience yeah. for very long-winded lectures yeah. on Genesis, two hours right. at a time, yeah. millions view. He yeah. sells out theaters. Mm-hmm. What do you think that says about the Bible? What do you think that says about our culture? Uh, my first thought, I, I, I do think it does, says something about the, the Bible and the culture, but I think my, my first thought is, what does that say about the church and the, mm. the various um, substitutes that the church has made to Bible teaching? Right. Um, we think, uh, many, many evangelicals think, if I'm going to speak to people today, I need to um, uh, uh, tell anecdotes and I need to, uh, uh, you know, Kind of uh, accommodate what I'm what I'm talking about. Accommodate the Bible to their uh, capacity, and then sugarcoat the bit. Of the can, yeah, or, and then Jordan Peterson comes yeah. along. Yeah, uh, not sure if he even believes the Bible in the way I would think it should be believed. Mm. But then he shows that there's profound depths to the Bible that exposes things about human life that yes. really resonate with people because they're you know they really are about human life. And so my first my first reaction to his ministry is to say or his ministry his work is to say um, this should be a rebuke to the church because yes. if we were teaching the Bible in the depth that it deserves yes. um, then uh, the church should be yes. recognizing and proclaiming these things yes. I do I, I think you're right it does show uh, some profound I mean Peterson's entire uh, uh, rise to, to international stardom uh, points up a number of things that are there's a profound hunger for I mean the his appeal to young men is quite dramatic, as mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And then the, the appeal that the Bible has in the way that he approaches it, because he's approaching it as a serious text about human life. About humans. It's yeah. actually written for humans, right. not just for Christians to fine tune their discipleship. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think it, it, does, uh, it does indicate a, a kind of longing for uh, mm-hmm. some exposure to, to deeper reality. I hope, and I hope Christians are paying attention to that and will recognize it. Uh, I, I, uh, back up, and I think this would be a this would fit with some of the other things we've been talking about. Um, uh, I'll cite Jim Jordan again. He's my you know, I don't I don't know anything except what I learned from Jim. Um, I mean, he's he's emphasized the fact that there need to be a variety of different sorts of events that churches are doing, with a variety of different tonalities and levels of levels of engagement. Um, uh, churches today tend to have be a Sunday morning gathering and then uh, maybe have some other Bible studies during the week, but we don't have the kind of variety of different kinds of events that speak to different sorts of people. But uh, you know, a church could have a liturgy where there's Bible teaching that's kind of in-house Bible teaching for the, for the gathered people of God, but then also have events in, do- in different venues and 
with different emphases that would be also Bible teaching, but in a different kind of mm. different kind of mode, a different kind of key mm. uh, that wouldn't be aimed so much at building up uh, the the already existing body as mm. trying to uh, would be a part of an evangelistic or an apologetic work. Mm. So having a, a variety of different sorts of events uh, and a different a variety of different sorts of uh, um, uh, rhetorics, I guess, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, would be a. It, that's what you'd want for a full, full yes. orbed yes. Uh, mission. And I guess Jordan Peterson has shown us that people will show up to right. discuss ideas and right. to think deeply about the Bible. Yes. And we don't need to sugarcoat the, the, the Bible as though it's right. a bitter pill that must be swallowed. But right. actually, yeah, there, there is an audience for this. Yes. And right. A hunger and a thirst. And uh, yeah, yeah, he, he is a rebuke to us. He definitely is a rebuke to us. Um, what, what do you make of. Uh, the place of apologetics. What, what, what's, what's your sort of uh, theology of, of apologetics, the place of the mind, the place of reason in sort of the, the conversion of people? Where, where, where do you fall on that as a good? Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of questions that are tangled up in that. Um, one, uh, uh, one dimension of it, I think, is um, um, part of what we've been already discussing. Um, could maybe put it this way: the church has an apologetic, but the church also is an apologetic. Mm -hmm. The church is a testimony to the work of God in the world, and a healthy community of believers that is welcoming and is uh, and is discipling people uh, that they're growing in maturity in Christ. Um, that's part of the uh, that's part of the proclamation of the gospel. It's part of the defense of. The gospel. This is really true, and you can tell it's true because this is what's happening uh, in places where people believe it and practice it. So I think that just thinking about apologetics as a set of arguments, I think, is too limited. I want to include the the church's own body life as part of the part of its apologetic work. Mm -hmm. But again, there are certainly places for um, for argument and testimony and uh, and addressing uh, uh, various kinds of challenges to. Um, uh, uh, to the Christian faith, mm -hmm. whether coming from science or uh, you know secular philosophy, I think there's mm -hmm. again if it, if you have a a church that in the aggregate has a, a full orbed ministry in different different kinds of venues, then that would certainly be one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess the uh, in answer to the question the the role of the mind, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, my uh, so much of our reaction to things is context dependent and my uh, in my context in the reformed Protestantism there has been a strong emphasis on theology on doctrine and on the mind and there's a tendency uh, Jamie Smith talks about uh, the view of the human being as a brain on a stick mm -hmm. uh, you forget the body and you forget the emotions mm -hmm. and you're just making an appeal to the mind so that's that's kind of the mm -hmm. bogeyman that I'm always trying to Trying to resist, so uh, reducing uh, Christian faith just to uh, just to the mind, or even reducing the appeal of the gospel just to an intellectual appeal, I think is a mistake. Mm -hmm. It has a, a full, uh, full holistic appeal. Mm -hmm. That's an appeal that includes an emotional appeal, mm -hmm. uh, and has a has a bodily and social dimension to it too. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I mean, my my tendency in that is to. Uh, Say so much uh, about the cautions about the mind that uh, you neglect the uh, neglect the the, the uh, essential character of uh, the intellectual appeal, which mm. I, I do think is essential to mm. a healthy Christian church. You can't you can't uh, you can't build a healthy Christian community. You can't build a healthy Christian mission uh, on a kind of emotional high. Right. It has to have doctrinal ballast and it has to have intellectual weight. Yes. Paul persuades people. Correct. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Okay, and, and so the church doesn't just have an apologetic, the church is an apologetic. What, what therefore is the character of the church? And, and can we get specific about uh, an evangelist? What would be the character of an evangelist that you would say is necessary as they go out to the nations and, and uh, speak of Jesus? Yeah, there'd be a, um, a number of different uh, characteristics that uh, uh, would be ideal an evangelist. I think there's a, you know, uh, uh, maybe a tendency to think of an evangelist as having a certain kind of personality, but 
I'm not sure that's the case. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I think of Tim Keller. Right. Um, I don't know Tim Keller personally, but um, listening to sermons and having some inkling of what he does, um, it's extremely low key kind yeah. of. He's not Billy Sunday. No, he's, no, he doesn't have a megaphone. No, he's not. Yeah. Uh, but extremely effective in just getting under people's skin mm -hmm. and uh, and really addressing uh, people where they're the questions that they're actually asking and the needs that they actually have. He's got a real gift for that. So I don't th I don't think it's a particular kind of personality. I think uh, obviously um, it involves um, profoundly Christ-like character. Um, that would be a requirement for any kind of ministry in the church. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to emphasize that partly because of the variety of scandals that we've had in the last mm -hmm. few decades, uh, mm -hmm. prominent Christian leaders who are caught out in various kinds of uh, personal scandals. And uh, their ministry can look very effective in terms of numbers, it can look very effective in terms of excitement, uh, but without the, um, unless they are really reflecting Christ in their person, and their, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's an essential part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think too that uh, thinking Paul is a kind of model evangelist, uh, one of the things that he stresses uh, in a number of places, uh, 2 Corinthians most prominently, but mm. I think he's alluding to it in, in Galatians when he talks about uh, bearing on the, his body the brand marks of Christ. Um, uh, he's uh, embodying the gospel in his suffering for the gospel. Mm. Uh, and I think a, a willingness to uh, to suffer opposition and uh, suffer uh, slander, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, suffer various forms of pe persecution. That'll take different forms in different parts of the world these days. But uh, a willingness to truly be a, a, a witness, a martyr in the in the mm -hmm. original and the classic sense. I think that's mm -hmm. that's certainly part of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I kind of highlight those things, not to minimize the kind of uh, the, the standard things that people would say about an evangelist and um, a, a knowledge of scripture and a knowledge of uh, the gospel, a, a freedom and willingness to preach the gospel in whatever context, mm -hmm. uh, a sense of um, the uh, sensitivity to the kinds of questions and oppositions that might uh, be being able to give an answer for the hope that lies within you and being able to address the, the objections those are all mm -hmm. part of the mm -hmm. part of the toolkit of the evangelist yeah but um, when I, I think uh, I'd want to stress the the personal character and the, yes. the willingness to suffer is something that maybe is neglected sometimes in thinking yes. about evangelism. Yes, whenever I do evangelism training, I always uh, say, you know, tell me some adjectives. When you think of an evangelist, what do you think mm. of? And they describe this horrible human being that's <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> thick skin, fire in their belly, yeah, yeah. always a man. Yeah. I always yeah. think of a man. Yeah. And, um, and then I say, okay, break up into pairs and tell your neighbor about somebody who was significant in you trusting Christ. Mm. Uh, and they end up with these much nicer you yeah. know, characteristics, you know, yeah. this person's warm and personable, always available, integrity, and yeah. all those sorts of things. So it's, I think it's absolutely right to start with, with character like that. Mm. So we're going to circle back to, to going to church again on, on, a, on a Sunday. Mm. But bef before we get there, um, is there a place for, some people call it cold contact evangelism, I call it sort of first contact evangelism mm. because it doesn't have to be cold, but mm. um, door to door, in the streets, yeah. Um, is, is there a place for that? Uh, I, I think absolutely. And this, again, is, a, I think, a signal of a breakdown of, of church order that mm -hmm. uh, that's, um, uh, isn't, maybe isn't done or isn't done as effectively. And I, what I have in mind is this. Um, you know, let's, we can blame the automobile uh, mm -hmm. and the availability of easy and cheap transportation. Mm -hmm. Uh, which gives you the opportunity to drive past dozens of churches on your way to a church where you that you ideal you yeah. feel you fit people ideologically like yeah people yeah. like me ideologically yeah. socioeconomically sometimes ethnically racially mm. um, even I'm not I don't uh, that's not a comment about uh, people being racist I think there's just a there's a there's a uh, um, there's a there's a uh, natural stick to our own yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. so um, I think the the modern 
the order of modern society, I think, presents particular challenges to um, the church functioning as an, a body within a particular place, a particular neighborhood. And so the door-to-door -door kind of work that you're talking about, I think, is bound up with the church having a sense of place, mm. being uh, set in a particular location, mm. uh, and having obligations to minister to the people within reach of the local church, the, you know, that are right next door. Um, and rather than, you know, uh, raising, raising the banner, uh, we're the truly Reformed Church, or we're the, right. you know, the, the truly Methodist, I don't know, truly right. Lutheran, whatever it is. Right. Uh, re rather than raising that banner as the attraction point for people from uh, mm. miles and miles away, you're right. put in a particular place, you're called to that place, mm. and those are your neighbors as a church. Yes. Um, the, other, the other part of church order that I think is um, relevant here, I have a friend um, who's a missionary in Peru, mm -hmm. uh, and one of his evangelistic strategies has been uh, to, uh, uh, they, they have a very strong sense of uh, localism, trying to work in a local area. And uh, one of his strategies has been, he puts on a clerical collar uh, and he walks from door to door, introducing himself to the neighborhood as your pastor. Right. I'm your pastor. Right. Uh, I'm at the church down here. Right. If you need pastoral care, I'm available. Right. That can lead into evangelistic uh, opportunities. Uh, it can certainly lead into mission, mission ministry opportunities because mm. some people do take him seriously and they you know when they have a family crisis mm. well this pastor this nice pastor came by mm. several months ago and his yeah. church is just down the block yeah i'm going to go see if i can get his help yeah um and there's a kind of um there's a kind of an assertion of authority there uh, god has placed us in this neighborhood mm. these people are our responsibility because god has placed us here mm. and whether or not they're members of my church mm. um these are the people that I'm supposed to minister to. Yeah, I remember reading Acts 17 and getting to the place where Paul says, from one man God made every race of men, and he, he determined the exact times and places where we should live. Mm -hmm. He did this so that men would reach him and find him, although mm -hmm. he's not far from each one of us. Yeah. So there is an evangelistic purpose mm -hmm. behind the geographical location where we are. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think that, that's fascinating about a church might want to raise a banner for being my brand of yes, church yeah. as opposed to raising a banner for I am a church for Eastbourne where yeah. I live. I'm a church for yeah. the, the locality. Yeah, and I do, I do think that there's a, there's a growing appreciation of that sense of place in mm -hmm. churches. There's a, um, in a lot of different areas, I, I see signs that there's a, a, a you know, kind of recovery of a sense of parish or neighborhood church life. Um, but the, the, the challenge is one of the challenges is um, it, it's you know it's much church life can be much easier if you're gathering people who are a lot like you. Hmm. Um, church life can be much either, easier if you're targeting people who already are like-minded. We want like-minded hmm. people to come in, hmm. and um, much easier and sometimes much more successful. You can gather a, a larger crowd if you put up a banner with a particular kind of uh, ministry, a particular kind of theology, and that's one that has some kind of uh, that has a certain degree of popularity you can mm -hmm. you can build a church rapidly mm -hmm. but i don't think you you have this we don't have the same kind of maybe not the same kind of depth and certainly not you're not fulfilling the calling that i think is placed on the church to be ministering in a particular locale. Mm -hmm. So when we go around the, the, the doors, I uh, go to an Anglican church in, in Eastbourne and uh, we would go and we'd say, hi, I'm Glenn, this is Peter, we're from All Souls Church. It's the one with the clock tower there. You, you're very welcome any Sunday. We'd, we'd hand them some literature and mm -hmm. on the front it would talk about Sundays. On the back it would talk about toddler groups and English as a second language, you know, English yeah, yeah. classes and debt counseling. and, and things like that. And so we draw their attention to one or two things and then sort of say, and, and do you have a faith yourself? Mm -hmm. And just, and see, and you know, and if, if they go quiet, we go quiet. Thank you, have a nice <laughs> yeah, day, and, right. and on we go. But yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's had a marked impact on yeah. the parish, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that uh, the, the kind of, I was trained in uh, Evangelism Explosion, the uh, D. James Kennedy's program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, uh, if you died tonight and you were standing before the pearly gates and Peter mm -hmm. said, or Jesus said, why should I let you into my heaven? Peter's not there, I don't think, in D. James Kennedy's uh, good pre yeah. Presbyterian. It would be Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why should I let you into my heaven? Yeah. Um, and that would, that's the opening to talk about mm -hmm. salvation by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, that was extremely effective mm -hmm. in the southern part of the United States 
uh, during a certain period of time, mm. uh, when you had mm. memory of God, <laughs> the gospel, right. when almost everybody that you ran into, and it's still the case in, uh, in large part in the South, I'm in Alabama and it's still very much the Bible Belt, um, but in, in particularly in you know, the era, era that Kennedy was developing that, um, it resonated with people yeah. um, in ways that I don't think it would today in the South quite as much, and it certainly wouldn't in other parts of the country. You know, what is heaven? Who is Jesus? Right. Why do I care? Yeah, is um, that even the case? Because you're you're in Birmingham, Alabama, yeah. right? That's yeah. even the case there. Um, I I think Bur like Birmingham and other parts of the South, Alabama is uh, uh, the most Protestant state in the United okay. States. Yeah. And, uh, the Bible I don't, on the Bible. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it was. The last survey was like 80, 80 some percent of the state identifies as Protestant. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it would be less, uh, uh, mm -hmm. very few people that I have met in over um, a total of uh, almost a dozen years of living in Birmingham at two different times, uh, very few people would admit to not being Christians. And, and many of them have had some contact with the church. They walked the aisle at some point, they got baptized. Right. right. Yeah, well, that kind of question makes sense. Yeah, to them, right. You know? It does. Yeah. But I think yeah. a lot of ca a con a context it doesn't. So the kind of thing that you're mm. pointing to, um, we have an English class. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. um, that's going to be appealing to people. You have certain kinds of um, community life mm. that they can be invited into. Mm. Uh, that seems to be hitting a need and something that they can I, that, that will that'll uh, meet them where they are in a way that. Mm. Some of those earlier types of evangelism mm. uh, don't as mm. much today. Mm. And you find, you find that as you scatter the seed more widely, you're, you're surprised by how hard some soil is and you're mm. surprised by how open mm. some people are at, at, at the very same time. So it's been great to get our, mm. get our congregation out there doing that yeah. sort of thing. But if, so let's, let's say it goes well and they say, oh, what time on a Sunday? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, 10.30, just over there. Mm -hmm. And they come, they come to your church um, I'm always thinking about 1 Corinthians 14, and, and Paul seems to, he has a category for um, those who are outsiders. They're, they're not believers, but they don't seem to be utterly hardened to the gospel, but they're, they're outsiders, and they don't understand everything that's going on, but they understand enough to say God is really among you. Mm -hmm. And I just think so often we sort of fall off either side of, of, of the horse. Either everything that goes on is so incomprehensible that no one could ever say God is among you. They just don't know what, what's going on. And, and some people, everything is so lowest common denominator. Um, it might be plain, but it's not plain that God is among you. Um, so how, how, do, how do you stay on that horse that, that things are to some degree comprehensible to the outsider, but also there's a sense that God is really among you? Yeah. Uh, a couple, a couple of thing, thoughts on that. One is, um, might be a longer conversation. I'm not sure exactly what kind of event is being described in First Corinthians four, uh, 14. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Is it a Lord's Day gathering, or is it some other kind of event where it's more, um, uh, you know, community sharing? Mm -hmm. um, okay. uh, that would that would be a, yeah. a, a that's a question in my mind, I, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure that I have a strong uh, conclusion on that, but it's. Mm. Uh, that that's a, that would be an, uh, something to explore, mm. and I think the other another uh, dimension of it would be, um, I think there have to be times when the focus of attention in the church is on building up the community of believers and instructing the people of God, and um, the people of God communing together, uh, uh, praising God together, praying together. Uh, you know, you think about a family analogy. Mm. Um, we're called to be hospitable. Mm. If every meal, every meal has guests mm. uh, and you never have a time when mm. it's family time, mm. then uh, that's, that's, that's not healthy for the family. Mm -hmm. The family has to, has to be together as family in order to be effectively hospitable. So I, I think there have to be family times. That doesn't mean that unbelievers would be excluded, mm. but it does mean that the the uh, focus or orientation of, and I think this, the Lord's Day liturgy is largely that. It's the mm -hmm. focus is on ministering to the uh, to the church and teaching the church, building up the church, gathering the church at the Lord's table. Uh, having said that, um, uh, suppose an unbeliever comes in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, first of all, in terms terms of preaching, mm -hmm. uh, is anything I is anything I'm going to say going to resonate with them? 
I think it's not going to resonate if my sermons are full of theological jargon mm. and if I'm teaching a kind of, if I'm, if I'm doing the, the kind of lecture that you mentioned earlier, if I've turned the, the worship service into a lecture moment, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. if I'm focused on teaching the Bible um, uh, with, you know, Jordan Peterson on my shoulder perhaps, <laughs> right. reminding me that the Bible is about human beings in real human situations. Right. Uh, and Jim Jordan certainly on one shoulder, uh, <laughs> telling me, uh, "Look at all the beautiful things that are here in Scripture." Right. So I think right. that uh, I try very hard to avo I, avoid um, uh, including technical terminology and jargon in sermons. Mm -hmm. I think there's a place for that. Certainly a place for that in theological training. A place for that in certain kinds of discipleship within the church and leadership training, that kind of thing. When you have the gathered people of God, you have people of, um, you know, every level of maturity, every age. You want to teach the Bible to them, and I think, uh, with the Jordan Peterson example that we've already discussed, uh, you can teach the Bible in a way that even an unbeliever who comes into that setting is going to say, "Wow, I, I never understood that about myself. I've never understood that about the world. I see the world differently now." And that, you know, that came from the Bible. That's a really interesting thing. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of preaching, that would be one important mm -hmm. part of it. To, mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, that's not to say I'm trying to uh, dumb down what I'm saying. Um, uh, I, I am going, I, you know, I'm going to avoid, I'll, I'm not going to have much discussion of Hebrew grammar, <laughs> 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 unless it's really crucial to the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. Um, usually I try to avoid that kind of thing. I want to teach the Bible uh, and I think it's God's word. It's the word of the Creator to His creatures, and that has its own power. Right. And I think so. So often I, because I'm preaching to unbelievers a lot of the time, um, some Christians hear me speak, and they say, "Ah, I see, Glenn, how you tried to get rid of jargon in your language so that you'd reach the non-Christian." Mm -hmm. And actually, I'm thinking it's actually because I'm trying to cre reach the Christian yeah. because I think so much of that jargon can mask our own ignorance. Mm -hmm. we, d we don't really understand what we say when we say sanctification or whatever. Um, and, and that actually finding synonyms and finding, yeah. finding ways of uh, explaining these things is not just for the outside. Yeah, it can could have put us in kind of mentally into, a, 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 into neutral and we, yes. we stop thinking because we, we have the term for it. We don't yeah. have to think about it anymore. But we want to see with new eyes. You know, we want to, we want to s and one of the ways of seeing with new eyes is actually trying to uh, trying to evacuate our language of, of pure yeah. jargon. Yeah. Uh, but to start again. The, other, the, other, the other thought I had about your question about the unbelievers coming into the Lord's Day service, um, there's a, uh, uh, I, I think a, a different, different kinds of churches have different kind of emotional atmosphere. And I don't think that there's, uh, there can be a variation that I think is uh, all, all different faithful expressions of, of Christianity in the liturgy. Um, there are certain kinds of liturgy and certain kinds of settings that are awesome in their uh, uh, kind of uh, beauty and, and in a sense the, the calm of and the, the peace of God is evident in the way that the liturgy is done. I think that communicates something about the gospel and about the, the, uh, about the, uh, about the Christian life and the Christian church. Um, uh, the emphasis that we've had at Theopolis is on, light, insofar as we can accomplish it as Reformed Presbyterians, we try to be vigorous and lively in worship. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenge for us. Uh, but a, a large part of that for us is musical. and. Mm -hmm. The kind of music that we're singing, the the content of the words that we're singing, we place a lot of emphasis on psalm singing, and we want psalms to be sung with uh, with vigor and with strength. And and if if you're really singing the psalms and singing the psalms from beginning to end, uh, and giving them their due, then you can't help but do that because their psalms are mm. psalms are vigorous. There are mm. war <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> There are war songs and there are lament songs and there, yes. there's, and I think, um, uh, you know, some of the churches I'm thinking of in the states that um, I think do this particularly well. I can imagine somebody coming in for the first time and just being blown away by right. the, the. Uh, I know that people come in to the churches that I'm I'm associated with, and they're blown away by the number of men, yeah, who are singing loudly yes. in church, yes, 
and they yes. never have seen this before in any kind of setting. Yes. Rarely yes. see people singing together, but they've never yes. seen so many men yes. uh, putting their putting their whole yes. uh, whole soul into singing. Yes. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Swansea, I, I, I think of, where uh, they, they do sing un unaccompanied. They also sing, sing Hillsong songs, you know, yeah. at, at, yeah. At, at times. But um, they speak of the, the huge evangelistic gain in, in just people coming and hearing sing. I mean, they sing so loudly, they get feedback in the yeah. room yeah. when nobody's <laughs> mic'd up. <Yeah. laughs> right? This is Wales. So, you know, you can understand it, but, but yeah. huge evangelistic uh, benefit in the singing. So we thought about word, we thought about singing, Let's finish with sacrament, mm. um, because I guess ever since Charles Finney, um, there's been this idea of, I guess, an altar call, which mm. is, you know, that's an interesting you know, yeah. word to use. Mm -hmm. And there's a thing called a, a sort of a prayer of commitment, which is sort of this, this point of my declaration before the world mm -hmm. that I'm committed to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, but more historically, sacramentally, yeah. um, there is an altar or table. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a, a ceremony of commitment, mm -hmm. um, the Lord's to us, but also our, our declaration to the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, so how do, we th how do we think with a proper view of sacraments about not replacing them with these new evangelistic sacraments called mm -hmm. a prayer of commitment? Mm -hmm. um, how, how would our sacramentology help us? Yeah, what, obviously you're referring in the, uh, uh, the commitment that you're talking about is baptism and the, the altar call. Uh, I'd, I'd say that uh, every every service that uh, we have at our church ends with an altar call. Mm -hmm. People are invited to come and yes. share in the Lord's table. Yes, uh, that's a more literal altar call than Charles yes. Finney had. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I think that's a, uh, important for, I guess for several reasons. I think it's important to give those their proper weight uh, and not let them be replaced by, as you say, kind of. Replacement sacraments that are um, these are the, and the, part of part of the reason for that is I think these are biblical rites that God has called us uh, commanded the church to do. Um, I think the the uh, Christian sacraments also place the emphasis properly on God's work and God's approach to us, as you've already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Baptism mm -hmm. is God's claim on the believer. Mm -hmm. There's a necessary response. And in fact, if you have an adult who's never been baptized, they're expressing some kind of faith before they're baptized. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if they're hit by a bus on the way to the baptism, they'll be in the new creation with the mm -hmm. rest of us. Mm -hmm. But uh, that public act, uh, I think it's the act of Jesus of claiming them. Right. That's the moment when you have a uh, Jesus publicly, officially claiming them as members of his body. Mm -hmm. And what's happening at the Lord's table is Jesus offering himself in his spirit right. as our food. So that those, uh, the, the, um, the alternatives, the you know, prayer, of, prayer of commitment or the altar call where you're, uh, you're walking the aisle, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of flip the, right. flip the emphasis from right. God's act toward us to my my human declaration, my human decision. Mm. Um, I think one of the reasons why those are so ingrained in um, evangelicalism is because they fit so neatly with kind of a modern emphasis on human decision and the will right. Right. and consent. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I have to consent only if I can consent. If I can, if I consent, mm -hmm. can God claim me? Mm -hmm. Well, right. no, yeah. that's not actually. That, yeah. but that's I the way. Choose my own identity. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah. There so, yeah. so there's a. Uh, I, th I think our, um, the, uh, yeah, the, the these replacement sacrament-like events kind of flip the relationship between God action our our decision. I think the the, the other, I mean, the the danger on the other side, obviously, is you have baptism practiced as if it were. Um, get out of hell free card mm -hmm. you've been baptized mm -hmm. uh, this is the yeah. problem that you find in places like alabama bible belt mm -hmm. um, maybe in in some kind of nominal anglican mm -hmm. uh, circles in the, in the uk where you know you've been christened you've been baptized you're good mm -hmm. you've you've given your you've been done yes yeah, uh, and god is satisfied with you and then there's there's no emphasis on that claim mm -hmm. uh, as a as a vocation, mm -hmm. there's no emphasis on baptism as uh, carrying obligations to the person who's baptized, but also obligations to other believers who are to 
encourage them in their in, into maturity in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the, the, it's not that it's not that decision is eliminated in a mm -hmm. properly sacramental understanding. Mm -hmm. It's that our decision is subordinated to God's claim on us, and our decision is always responsive. We're always. Right loving uh, the God who first loved us. Right. And so as I bring my sermon to a close, and I, I've spotted that there's these unbelievers, you know, in, in, in the congregation, I am calling them to the God who is calling them already. I am, I am saying, uh, be reconciled mm -hmm. to the God who is reconciling you in Christ. Mm -hmm. What does that sound like? What do I like? Yeah. And especially, like, okay, I, I don't know whether they're baptized or not. Right. You know, do I say, come forward to the table yeah. uh, and receive? Um, yeah, I, I, just in terms of the form of words, I think there's, it's important to say, um, if you want to come and share this table, then you need to be, um, you, need, you need to wash up, you know. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. follow, your, follow your mom's instructions that you wash up before you come to the dinner table. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's only the circumcised who took Passover. Yeah, it's right. the baptized who right. took communion. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that yeah, you can make a, a, a powerful appeal to you know, the unbeliever who's in the, in visiting the congregation. Um, uh, God, is, God invites us into his own life in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He invites us to share in this table to receive Christ. He invites you. What you can see is he invites you to come into this community of joy and fellowship. Uh, uh, come, mm -hmm. join, uh, repent of your sins, mm -hmm. uh, turn to Jesus Christ, and join us as the body of Christ. I think you make a very powerful appeal that's kind of sacramentally oriented. Yes. Um, I, I I wouldn't invite them to come and share the Lord's table mm -hmm. uh, as a, it, I insist that they be baptized uh, yes. before they do. If you know. If somebody gets excited, an unbeliever gets excited and rushes to the, rushes to the Eucharist and receives it, and finds out you find out later he's been baptized, I think Jesus can sort that out. Yes. I don't think that's the end of the world. <laughs> um, but there's a proper order to things. Yeah, but wash up before you come. That's yeah. and that's that's a, a great note to finish on. That, yeah, the call is into this festal gathering. The call is to belong to this family of life. Yeah. Leave leave the old self at the door. Right. Wash up. Yeah. Come on home, join the joy. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's what a, a holistic kind of evangelism looks like. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Peter Lightheart, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Glenn. It's been great.